I'm Greg McIntyre, McIntyre Elder Law, helping seniors protect their assets and legacies. I'm an elder law attorney. What does that mean? I heard estate planning, protecting seniors, okay? So does it just affect the senior? If I save a home, if somebody's in my office and says, you know, I'm getting ready to lose my house, or how about a house that mom and dad worked for their entire life is getting ready to get back recovered by Medicaid because they paid for dad's nursing home care for a multiple years. Or I have a wife who's in, in the office. This is most of the time the case in, in that type of situation where the husband's needing care. They're really, really spending down all their retirement, their hard-earned money and property, and they're trying to figure out how to activate some type of health care benefit to pay for long-term care, and they want to be able to protect the money that they've worked for their entire lives. I present solutions and tools that we have and strategies that we have to do that under the law to help them. And then if I save that home, not only does it certainly give peace of mind to the family, the people that own the home, but it also could send a grandchild to college or several grandchildren to college. Sometimes I meet with seniors who are literally worried to death. They're visibly, they've been staying up nights. They're worried that they're going to lose everything because of a healthcare situation and they don't know what to do. And it makes me feel very good to sit down with them and see a relief come over them as we talk it through and present options. And there's literally a visible change from the time we started the consult to the time we finished, which I like to call peace of mind. So to me, that's what estate planning and elder law is. Elder law is a niche area within the practice area of estate planning. That's just me. I'm Greg McIntyre. I'm a proud member of Elder Council. Elder Council is a national group of elder law attorneys. Um, which gives me a really deep bench. It's not just me answering questions every day. And, and I've got thousands of attorneys behind me all across the United States that may have seen problems I haven't seen before, and I help them answer questions, and they help me as well. So I'm, a, I'm very proud to be a member of Elder Council. We named the firm McIntyre Elder Law a number of years ago just so that people wouldn't be confused about what we did. And so I wouldn't get confused because I do get confused. I like to help people and I might take your speeding ticket. I might defend you in a criminal case in front of a jury. I love to speak in front of juries and do those cases and have done many of them in the past. But you know, I want to stay in my lane and just practice estate planning and elder law. But still people come in and ask me who my partner, Mr. Elder, is. And they do that on a regular basis, at least once a day. So elder law is an area of law, not my partner. My partner is Britton Begley, and he is actually in the back. How many people in here had jobs or have jobs? As passionate as I am about elder law, it's still a grind sometimes, okay? Because I'm working late, you know, and I'm calling people back, making sure I call everybody back before I go home. What kind of jobs did you have? Who, was anybody a nurse? A teacher? It doesn't matter if you dig ditches for a living. You help people, right? And if you can put it in terms of helping people, it makes you feel good. It always makes me feel good at the end of the day if I can feel like I've helped someone. And I like to think that estate planning and elder law is happy law, and I enjoy doing that. So I love helping people. And also, I have some whys, okay? And a few of those are up here. This is my grandfather, Worth McIntyre. That's me a few years ago. And he was probably in his late 90s there. Worth lived to be 99. And he spent the last 14 and a half years of his life at Shelby Manor, which is on Wyke Road across from the YMCA in Shelby. It cost a lot of money for him to do that. When he started out working as a young man, probably as a teenager, but as a young man, you know, he got married young. They had six children, okay? My dad is the youngest of those children, and he was what's called a tenant farmer. So he, they, someone let him farm the land, live there, and at the end of the year, you know, he would hopefully share in some of the proceeds. Well, at the end of the year, the first year, the guy he farmed for stiffed him and wouldn't pay him. I don't know about you, but I would probably need at least a civil attorney, maybe a criminal attorney, at the end of that year if 
that were me, okay? I can guarantee you I would if I'd worked the entire year and you paid me zero. Not to be deterred, he's a very talented furniture maker as well and woodworker, had a workshop and also worked in the mills in the area uh, to make ends meet for the family, but ended up working hard over his life and acquiring a small farmhouse and land in Lattimore, North Carolina, you know, which is just down the road. And in the end, lost every single thing that he had ever worked for to pay for long-term care, to pay for assisted living care. That never sat right with me. I did not think that was right. I did not like that. That for no fault of his own, because of a health care issue, and maybe lack of access to people who were in the know or had the education, the ability, and the strategies and the tools to help him save the farm, he lost everything. So, I've committed my practice and my education, my ability, to researching ways for people to save their farms, which to me is a metaphor for everything you work for every day and acquire. I mean, if you think about it, you buy a house, you borrow from the bank, you pay the bank back three times as much as you bought your house for over 30 years. I said it wasn't going to be a political speech. I feel like a politician. Right? <laughs> I'm like knee deep in that. Okay, sorry. From the 50 cents out of the dollar that you get home with, you know, you pay for benefits and other things, right? Tax dollars. And then to access a health care benefit like long-term care Medicaid to pay for assisted living or, long -term, or nursing home care, you end up losing your house and everything else, right? I just don't think it's a good system. I've always been one to kind of fight the man or fight the system. And it's what I do with estate planning and elder law. It's what I do as a criminal attorney. It's what I do every day. It makes me happy. And I'm able to help people, okay? That's one of my whys right there. There's, these are six of my whys. These are our six children. That's my beautiful wife, Stephanie, on the end, and our six kids. And, that's, and so daddy's got to work, and I do. We work very hard for our family and to help protect yours, okay? So that's a little bit about me and what I do and why I do what I do. So at our firm, we have three departments, estate planning, benefits planning, and probate. Estate planning, I call it more pre-planning because in elder law, we always have an eye on that fact that 70% of people over the age of 65 are going to need some type of long-term care during their lives in-home assisted living or nursing home care. And it costs a little bit to provide that, okay? So we always wanna be aware of that fact. Do you have long-term care insurance in place? How do you get that? I'm not an insurance agent, but I work with lots of professionals who are very good at providing that in different ways. If you do have that, it can be a godsend because when you need care, it can be provided in home. Who wants to go to a nursing home? Am I the only one? I'm the only one, right? So no, would you rather be cared for in the comfort of your own home? Of course. And not to get too political. I, I point out there because somebody tried to start a political discussion at my table back there today. And I said, I'm gonna keep it between the lines. Two things I'm not gonna discuss today is religion and politics, okay? Certainly their benefits programs are not out there to provide for in-home care like they are for facility care, okay? like they are for nursing home or assisted living care. Estate planning. Benefits planning, we help people, people with situations like Medicaid crisis planning to help people protect assets and qualify for benefits to pay for care if they need it. I'm also a proud veteran of the United States Navy. Uh, do we have any veterans here? Thank you. What branch? What branches? Navy. Navy. What does Navy stand for? Never again volunteer yourself. He's the first person in hundreds and hundreds of seminars that I've given or educational events where somebody knew what it was. I'm going to give you five after this fellow seaman. Where are you stationed? Oh, man, that, is that, they have the Navy in Charleston, South Carolina? Okay, cool. I was stationed out of San Diego. Did you ever go, uh, go around uh, the plant or anything like that? Uh, a sub. A sub, okay. Oh, man, we have a different, different kind of sailor over here. He likes to get in a boat that sinks. That's just, I, I don't understand it. My dad worked on subs, he was in the Navy, but uh, thank you for your service. I appreciate that, yeah, yeah. Over here, you, you sir. Air Force. Air Force, thank you for your service. Certainly, certainly, very good branch. Yes, sir. What, Navy. Navy, what'd you do in the Navy? I was a diesel mechanic. Diesel mechanic, okay. What, what kind of, uh, did you work on ship engines or? Ship engines. Ship engines, okay. 
I was on a diesel carrier, the Connie. I think the Connie's decommissioned now, but the Whitby Island. Whitby Island, yeah, okay, sure, sure, sure. I was on the Connie and then the Nimitz, but uh, Nimitz is a nuke. Thank you for your service. Yeah, and uh, I was always scared to go down, go down where you worked. I mean, that's, it gets scary, man. You start going down below decks, and you're, and you're like, you know, things start creaking and stuff. And I like to stay up above the water line. Who else is, is in the service? Army. Army. Aren't ready for Marines yet. Is that what that, no, I'm just kidding. Thank you for your service. I have my grandfather, J.C. Horn, was in World War II. He was a machine gunner in the Army. I appreciate your service. Yes, ma'am. Army. Army. Thank you for your service in the Army. Women, and women in the military. Right, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, so there are veterans benefits for people out there and seniors like veterans aid and attendance pension benefits, okay? I am uh, a certified attorney through the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, all right? And uh, I help families qualify for veterans aid and attendance pension benefits. That's for a veteran or spouse of a deceased veteran. And max benefit for that, and it goes down from there, is two married veterans at about 34000 uh, and then it goes down to married, a married veteran to a non-veteran spouse. Uh, I want to say that's around 2,300. Single veterans, around 1,800. Spouse of a deceased veteran is around $1,300. Max benefit. And that's for when you have some trouble. You'll hear insurance guys talk about ADLs, activities of daily living. So if you have trouble ambulating, walking, you know, if there's any incontinence going on. Um, help dressing, bathing, fixing meals, eating meals. Um, you know, if you have two out of six of those ADLs, you could qualify for that benefit um, as verified by a doctor. There's some other asset and income qualifiers for that benefit, but that's a really nice benefit that, especially if you need some in-home care or assisted living care, if we activate that, sometimes takes people from having a real deficit where they have a shortfall or burn rate where they're going through savings to try to pay for care to where they actually have a surplus every month to pay for care. So that's a really nice benefit that the VA does not advertise. They do not do, I have a love-hate relationship with the VA, I'm telling you, okay? I have VA healthcare because I was in the military in a war zone during wartime, okay? But I mean, you know, in my opinion, it's been hit or miss, okay? Depends on who you talk to. There's great things about it. When it works, it works that there's a lot of red tape, okay? Right, and, and sometimes you need some help getting through that red tape. We help people cut through the red tape. And then probate, and that's after someone passes away, okay, and handling their estates. So that's a little bit about what the practice of elder law is. But I wanna kinda stay on topic of what we're here today for, which is a health fair. And we're in a health fair, and I assume everybody here is interested in being healthy, a healthy lifestyle, I mean, we're talking today about, you know, the word vegans being thrown around a lot and, and plant-based products, things like that, which, which is great. Uh, from my perspective, I help people plan ahead for health care scares and situations in their lives and things that can affect their assets. Also, tax situations. There, you know, there's just a lot of areas of law that we hit within estate planning and elder law. The thing that comes to mind is, simply starting with healthcare powers of attorneys and living wills. Anybody know what a healthcare power of attorney is? Does anybody know what powers of attorney are? Yes, sir, what's a, health, what's a power of attorney or healthcare power of attorney? Incapacitated or incompetent. Sir, what's your name? Leonard said, what a healthcare power of attorney is something that activates if someone becomes incompetent or incapacitated and appoint someone else to make your important health care decisions. Put my six children up, okay? Do you think they ever agree on anything? Ever? Ever. I could ask them what color this floor is or, or this thing right here. Is this, it's brown, right? Um, it, man, they would argue over that all day and they'd break into factions and then they'd get into fights. They'd start wrestling around. And I know who would pair up against who. And I just picture myself laying you know, in a hospital bed. And they're trying to figure something out, you know, about some kind of procedure or, or and really, and that's not too far off from what some families are like, okay? Um, and it, it can get nasty. While all the while I'm laying there and somebody needs to make 
an important health care decision for me, okay? Just do one thing, just do something, you know? I just, I don't know, but do something, you know? Because I'm tired of hearing you argue. Um, so it can, it can stem those arguments, it can stop those arguments, and, and it's time in a health care power of attorney to be a little selfish. Appoint the person who you trust to make important health care decisions for you, okay? I, I would recommend, as someone who's done this for a long time, appoint one person. Because if you appoint two people, they might not agree. And who breaks the tie? The better looking one? I would say that's the better looking, okay? I don't know if the doctor one would, would agree, right? And people might disagree on who looks better. I don't know. The smarter one, the shorter one, the taller. You can make those decisions, okay? I think it's time to be a little selfish there um, and to choose the person you know is going to make the right decision for you. And quickly. And, and I call it the quarterback. So you huddle, huddles up with the family, can run the plays into the doctors, the facility, and then, you know, and keep the family on the same page. And you all know the, the person that comes to mind that would do that. For me, in my estate plan, in our estate plan for my wife and I, which I just updated a couple of years ago because at that time I was doing for everybody else and not myself. The cobbler had no shoes, so to speak. So, so uh, ours, it's her first, and then it goes to our oldest son, who's 20, but he's always been mature and wise beyond his years. That's how ours is set up. Yours could be set up differently, but it's very important to choose the right person. In addition, you want to make sure that it has a HIPAA authorization built in in a post-HIPAA world or a now HIPAA world, I, I, I practiced before HIPAA came, came about and afterwards, okay? Um, and it used to not be that tough for an attorney to pull medical records. Now it is extremely hard unless you have that HIPAA authorization. They will not talk to you on the phone. I don't care if you're the spouse, right? We don't care if you're his wife. We are not going to talk to you. We are not going to allow you to pull medical records. We are not going to give you any authority to examine anything. So you want to make sure that healthcare power of attorney has a HIPAA authorization built in and within it, okay? It does not need to be recorded at the Register of Deeds to survive incompetency or incapacity. It is naturally built that way under the law in North Carolina. It is only for situations where you are unable to make your own healthcare decisions. As long as you are walking, talking, maybe laying down, talking lucid, you can make your own decisions. It's your decision, okay? when you're not able to make those decisions, then it rolls to the person you appoint. Here's a question. Should you appoint a backup? Let's say um, I, I love basketball. I played a lot of basketball. Um, if I go on the road, do, do I want to take four other guys with me to play a game? Five people on, on one team on, at the same time. How, how many people do I want to take with me to play? Just five? What if one fouls out or one gets hurt or you know, can't continue, right? I, I need a sub to come in to keep playing the game, right? So you want to appoint s someone else if you have more than one person you trust, someone as a backup to come in and step into that role so that you laying there are still taken care of. The right decisions are made for you. Sometimes people that you appoint might pass away or they might age out or they might become you know, incompetent or incapacitated themselves, it's time to review those documents and get new ones in place, okay? And that happens all the time as well. So that's a pretty good rundown of a healthcare power of attorney. Pretty good. But I think we'd need to talk about it in the context of a living will as well. Does anyone have a question about a healthcare power of attorney before I move to living wills? So under the Full Faith and Credit Act, okay, a power of attorney in one state should be good in another state, right? However, practically, there's a practical answer too. Nobody in that other state is used to seeing these other powers of attorney, and they don't know what the law is in that state. It's like having a will from another state and then moving to North Carolina. And I see people who do that all the time, okay? I practice in Shelby and Charlotte. And believe it or not, nobody in Charlotte's from Charlotte, okay? There's like Half a dozen people in Charlotte that are actually born there and live there, okay? Everybody else is from somewhere else. And most of the time when I see people there, they're asking questions of, hey, are all these complicated estate planning documents I had done in Vermont good here? I'm like, eh. I'm an attorney in North Carolina. 
They should be, but then you're looking at a clerk of court or a bank who's looking at a, a financial power of attorney or a doctor or a hospital who's trying to analyze a healthcare power of attorney. Is that what, let's say I'm laying there and I need my kids to make that, I need somebody to make that important decision for me, right? That life or death healthcare decision. Well, sorry, ma'am, we've got to take, or sorry, sir, whoever I appointed, we've got to take that healthcare power of attorney and give it to our legal team to examine for a couple of weeks and then we'll get back to you. I don't want to put people in situations like that. So the practical answer is the state you live in is where you should have your documents drafted, okay? That's where you should create your estate plan, okay? Is the state where you reside. Because if you die there also, it's going to be the state that interprets all your estate planning, will, trust, things like that, okay? That's the short answer. And your powers of attorney, you're always going to have a practical problem using them with banks or healthcare facilities, okay? I hope I answered that question. That's a very good question. Very good question, okay? Any other questions regarding healthcare powers of attorney? Uh, the question is, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, does an elder, elder law attorney also help people that have in families after someone has passed away? The answer is yes, and that is probate, okay? That's what probate or estate administration or trust administration. That's helping guide people through that process. Or, on the nasty side of it, helping defend lawsuits like will caveat suits when somebody's mad because something happened with moving money or property or redrafting a will or something. So we help defend those lawsuits and we, we help bring those lawsuits too. We, we do probate litigation as well, okay? We have a lot of experience in probate litigation, so yeah. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay, let's talk about a living will and how that relates to a healthcare power of attorney. A living will, who knows what a living will is? It was named by a stupid attorney because it ain't about living and it's not a will. It sounds nice though, a living will. It's better known as a declaration for a desire or of a desire for a natural death. Declaration of a desire for a natural death. Is that a DNR? I'll just go ahead and throw that out there before somebody asks the question. DNR stands for do not resuscitate, right? A living will is not a DNR. If I drop of a heart attack right now. I, I'm not dead, but it's, it's happening. It's the big one or something, I don't know. I'm down, paramedics come. Do you think I want them to revive me? Yeah. Yes, oh yes I do. Daddy's gotta work, I have six kids, okay? <laughs> right, I need to get back in the game. I'm, I need to cut down on my stress level, I need to eat a more vegan, plant-based diet, and I need to keep, keep going, okay? A living will would not prevent the paramedics from reviving me. Okay, a DNR would. Okay, a do not resuscitate document. I saw this article one time and it was kind of funny. There was some gang member in LA who had DNR tattooed across his neck because he thought it would be funny. And when the paramedics came, they didn't know whether to revive him or not. True story, not joking. And so if I had a DNR taped to my chest, okay, they should not revive me because I've made a deal with my doctor that I've had enough with whatever I'm going through and I don't want to be revived. A, li a living will is a legal document or declaration for a desire for a natural death, as it's also called as a legal document that says if I'm terminal, if I'm incurable, let's say brain death has occurred. Do not ask my wife if that has occurred yet because she might say it already has. <laughs> I guarantee it depends on the day. Is it okay to let me go? If I'm in a persistent vegetative state, and any medical means or any medical procedures that are done are, are going to just prolong my suffering, is it okay to let me go? That's what a living will is. And, and I'm telling you, hey, I'm going to release from liability my wife as my healthcare agent for making that decision, okay? That, I hate to say it, pull the plug decision, right? Yeah. And let me go. Um, and releasing the hospital and the doctors for complying my, with my wishes. It's my voice in the room. It's a place where we can put other wishes too. I am not a Catholic, but you may be. I have drafted living wills for priests before. You're very concerned if you're Catholic that you make sure that last rites, the Eucharist, are administered prior to being let go. So, so we want to put that in the living will. There may be specific religious concerns, okay? Lois asks, 
you know, there's got to be some cog cognitive or mental criteria, mental bar capacity, right? You must have capacity. As an attorney, that's how I would say that. Capacity to contract. If you sell me a car, I need to probably not be drunk or, or, or mentally incompetent where you have to take my hand and write an X or a signature, right? And I don't know what I'm signing or doing. Same thing with a living will, will, healthcare power of attorney. You need to be competent when you sign that. That's why I have real problems with hospitals and I'm surprised that they haven't gotten their pants suit off literally for shoving living wills and healthcare power of attorney form documents in people's faces when they walk through the door or they're rolled in on a stretcher. I've heard of people rolling in on a stretcher and then putting, uh, putting it there for them to sign. You think I can make a competent, reasonable, th well thought out decision as I'm being rolled in on a gurney? The answer is no. Just please help me, right? I'll sign anything you want me to sign, right? Yeah, you should be competent when you sign it. Short answer, okay? So, but also, you know, a living will should be contemplated in the terms of your healthcare power of attorney too. And here's how they work together. I would hate to think we live in a world where insurance companies can determine what procedures are offered to me. But I think we're already there. And I think we've been there for some time. I would say there's probably pressure on the doctors, the administration, the hospital, from the insurance companies. And in a situation where I have a living will and that's being pushed, it's being said, hey, there's a living will here. Do we want to go ahead and let Greg go? I want my wife to be able to step in and trump that living will and, and override that. If we're playing cards, you know, I want the, her, the human element, to be able to say, wait a second. Let's check this out. Let's think about this for a minute, okay? So I want to leave a, 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 an element of human control in there and, and decide which, which document rules. So I think the healthcare agent's wishes, you appoint them for a reason, needs to be respected and can trump that living will just in case, okay? Just in case. So I thought those were the most important documents and legal things for us to talk about at a healthcare event where we're talking about good health and good decisions, right? There's a lot more. We could be here for a long time, but we've had some fun and talked about healthcare powers of attorneys and living wills. If I were to continue with foundations, we would cover financial powers of attorney, which I would argue are the, or, or also called general durable powers of attorney, which I would argue are possibly the most important document you could ever have while you're alive. When do wills have power? Everybody, when they know I'm an estate planning attorney, the Larry the Cable Guy question is, you do wills? Yes, sir, I do wills. But that may or may not be the best and safest place to pass your hard-earned money and property. It really depends. Plus, your will only has power if you die. Let's start with, do you have a general, general durable power of attorney in place that's the financial power of attorney that is recorded at the Register of Deeds so it makes sure it survives incompetency or incapacity and appoints someone that you trust to make sure they have control of your assets to either pay the bills, protect the assets, or qualify you for benefits if you become incompetent or incapacitated. And those are written wrong all the time, by the way. Um, but if you get in a situation where you do become because of stroke, fall, accident, illness, injury, you become incompetent or incapacitated. And you don't have a financial power of attorney in place. Who can access accounts in your name? Who can access your IRA, which is your retirement account and nobody else's? Who can access any financial asset that you have, real estate? If we wanted to put a ladybird deed or some kind of protective deed on a house, how could we do it? The answer is you can't and you're stuck. And that's a tough conversation to have with a family when they come in. Unless you apply for guardianship, which is a court proceeding to be over someone's money or health or both. And then you have the court as the overseer or with oversight over any decision you make. 
besides just paying for health care or normal expenditures. Which may, it would not be what I would want if I were in that situation and my wife needed to protect our assets in my retirement to pay for our kids' college. Okay? So that would not be a good situation because the courts just like to see it spent down, honestly, because they're scared to do anything with it. So, yes, ma'am. This would be while they're alive. Yeah. Yeah, so think about it. If, if I'm laying there, my kids are trying to fight over what needs to be done with me. I'm not giving them anybody through a general durable power of attorney that's correctly recorded at the Register of Deeds, a financial power of attorney as it's called, the option or the ability to access any financial asset that I have or do anything with real estate or investments, anything, bank accounts, apply for benefits. I haven't given anybody that option. How can they, good luck, call on the bank. If they went to the bank or call my IRA, you know, investment guy, or, or, or tried to put a protective deed on property, they can't do that. I can't sign my name. I don't know what's going on. They're stuck. I want you to go to the bank on Monday and try to get into my bank accounts. Can you do that? I'm just kidding. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> you won't get much, okay? But, uh, you know, they wouldn't do it, right? I mean, because I haven't granted you the power to do that in that situation. Yeah, you're shut down. That's the most important document because that gives options. And it puts the reverse in the estate plan. If things change, we could always go a different direction. As long as somebody can make those decisions for you that you trust, that's, that's a trustworthy person. Got to be able to trust that person 100% though, right? Can you catch, sir? Bam! That'd be a yes. I just gave him my keys. What's it? What's it? No, keep them. Keep them. Keep them. There's my car keys. No, I didn't. I didn't give you my car key. Here's my car key. It's outside. This is my car key, my house key, my office keys. Um, probably a safety deposit box key. Uh, I've just made him my, my financial attorney, in fact, my agent, okay? I don't know this gentleman. I really hope he's a trustworthy guy. Would it be smart for me to make somebody that I don't know really well or I don't trust an agent for me to handle my finances? No, that would be foolish. It would be, she said it would be stupid. Yeah, I was trying to be nice. That would be foolish, yes. Yeah, so you got to trust that person 100%, and I'm sure this gentleman would do a great job with that. And all I ask in return is that jacket, sir. We're going to trade jackets. <laughs> again. Okay, that's it. All right. Okay. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's a great question. She said, would it be better to have a power of attorney, a financial power of attorney, or to just go ahead and transfer everything over, say, in the kid's name, right? Here's the question I would ask back. I hate to answer. It's such an attorney thing to do. I'm going to answer a question with a question. At what age should I give away all my hard-earned money and property? At what age? Yes. I'm 25 right now. At what age should I give away my hard-earned money and property? No. Well, well, I'm 25. But at what age? At what age should I give away my whole, my my home and? I would say 40, 45. 45. 45. Seven. Seven. Okay. Tell me why. Yeah. Person of that age, they have experienced a lot. Yeah. And they pretty much began to settle. Yeah. But so you give a 25-year-old. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on. Let's be oh, if you had given me a bunch of money at like 18 years old, I would have done something really. Oh, I'd have been in Myrtle Beach with a Lamborghini and a drug problem or something. I don't know. Something stupid. I'd have, you know, it wouldn't have been good. Something really redneck with it. It wouldn't have even been classy. It would have been trashy. Yeah. Don't give me a million dollars. Don't give anybody a million dollars at 18. Please. Rule to live by. Yes. That's what trusts are good for. Trusts are good for that. Guardianship is overseen by the courts. Yes, ma'am. the only way that a person can obtain guardianship? Yes. Okay. Yes, you have to go through the court system. It has to be a hearing. The person that is the subject of the competency question, the first part of that is, is someone competent or not? And you have to prove they're not competent, okay? That's the first part. And, and they have to be served by sheriff with that paperwork and ask to come to the hearing. And whether they show or not, that's a different story. But that hearing has to be had. I've been through some really, really contentious guardianship, contested guardianship situations with families. Very contentious, yes. She said, hey, when I pass, can my daughters avoid probate? The answer is yes. 
Um, it's actually quite easy to avoid probate. I'm going to answer this question first before I move on. I don't think that there is a good age to give away your hard-earned money and property. I think that if we live in that system, it's, it's, just, it's just, it's gotten too bad, okay? I mean, I mean if I want to give my kids something, I'm going to do that out of the kindness of my heart, and that's my prerogative to do so, but I don't want to be forced to do that because I'm scared I'm going to lose it because of some healthcare situation. There are lots of legal ways under the rules in, in the United States and North Carolina to protect your money to do estate planning. Some of them are inexpensive. Some of, you know, some of them aren't, it just depends, you know. But uh, certainly worth looking into. There's a lot of options besides just giving away your hard-earned money and property. Plus, I mean, the, the bad part, and I explained, I was explaining this to someone yesterday who had a very trustworthy son, and we were doing that. We were moving the house over into his name, okay? But I mean, I have gotten those calls. I've gotten late night calls with people crying because their daughter threw them out of the house because they had this continuing disagreement or meth or I don't know, something was going on, you know? Because when you give somebody else your house, it's not your house anymore, right? So let's not do that, okay? There's many other ways to set it up, okay? Where you stay in control of your money and property for the rest of your life and then it passes at your death. And then that rolls into your question is, can I avoid probate? Yes, you can. Um, bank accounts, now uh, checking savings, money market accounts, you can easily add payable on death beneficiaries to those accounts. You just go to the bank and tell them that. That doesn't mean the beneficiary, which might be your child, children, that doesn't mean they have control over your bank account. That just means that if you pass away, it makes it easy for them to get that money. By presenting an ID and maybe filling out a small claims form, and a death certificate, okay? Yeah, maybe proving who you are, right? So, you know, putting beneficiaries on things like bank accounts avoid probate. You can set up deeds with grantees where you hold the property for the rest of your life and it automatically passes to the kids when you pass. Those are things too. I think I'm gonna get the hook in a second, right? <laughs> I think it was getting ready to come. So I'm gonna digress. I've really, really enjoyed speaking with you today. If you would like to speak to me or one of our attorneys further about estate planning or elder law, we have a table right in the back in the center. It's got a blue McIntyre elder law apron on it to meet with us and talk about protecting you or your family or your parents or whomever you're here for that harder money and property, okay? Thank you so much for being here and allowing me to speak. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.